Welcome to Columbia Rotary on August the 10th, 2015. We're glad you're here. Um, I do want to start today with a bit of sad news. Longtime Rotarian Ben Cannell uh, passed away last week. Uh, he was a member for a number of years. He sang uh, the national anthem for us for a long, long time. Uh, so I want to start today with a moment of silence as we remember Ben. sing our national anthem led by Audrey Brown. visiting Rotarians and guests, we have uh, Joseph James. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is always a pleasure to greet people and shake hands with them as they're coming into a big room as opposed to what I do most of the time and shaking hands as they go out. So thank you for that experience today. We have three visiting Rotarians, uh, Jim Hudson with Columbia East, Beaver Hardy with Columbia East, and Emerson Smith from Five Points. And now do we have any guests? We invite you to please stand at this time. She's my guest. <laughs> this is my guest, Deborah Cameron. Deborah is our Director of Aerospace Initiatives with the South Carolina Council on Competitiveness and works very closely with our speaker today. Thanks. My guest today is Megan Anderson. Megan is a uh, project manager at the Department of Commerce and works on aviation projects. I'm Adam Jordan. My guest today is Sarah Corbett. Sarah is a friend of mine and also the Chief Operating Officer for the Public Employee Benefit Authority. Okay, uh, for health and happiness. 
us today. We have uh, John Dozier going to come up and uh, share share with us what's going on. Um, as we have a minute here, I'll remind you to put a couple dollars in the cart bucket on each table. Uh, the money uh, contributed there goes to support Alzheimer's research. John. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I, I took this job job pretty seriously, and I and I pulled everyone uh, to make sure that we really did have a, an accurate reflection of what's going on here. And I can tell you that everyone is in is in pretty good health and is relatively happy. <laughs> I would drop the mic and walk off the stage, but I think that there's a few other announcements that we need to make. Uh, Joseph James' uh, son, uh, Joe, is a senior at Wofford, and uh, he just completed a cycling journey uh, for Pi Kappa Phi fraternity, which started uh, over on the West Coast and ended in Washington, D.C. Uh, just uh, this last Saturday. Now, when I say cycling, I'm not talking about motorcycling. <coughs> he bicycled. Started in uh, the, the latter part of April. I think that's a phenomenal achievement. So, congratulations, Joseph, to your son, Joe. Um, again, he's a senior over at Wofford, and uh, uh, Pi, Kappa, Pi, Pi Kappa Pi fraternity raised over six hundred thousand uh, dollars for special needs children in that endeavor. Uh, Tom. Gammon's wife, uh, Susie, uh, had an unfortunate fall at the, uh, at the beach uh, recently. She broke her leg in two places and is currently recovering over at NHC in Lexington. So certainly I ask that you uh, extend your prayers uh, and thoughts uh, to uh, Tom uh, and his wife. And of course, Meredith Atkinson uh, is um, uh, Susie's uh, daughter. And she's also a member here in the chapter. Uh, Kathy Kennedy, where are you, Kathy? Congratulations. Uh, your grandson took his first steps last week, <laughs> even before his first birthday. Now, now I will tell you, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a researcher, and, and I think there's a correlation between uh, children walking at an early age and intelligence. So I think that you have something, but if, but if that falls through, he might have an amazing track career. <laughs> um, and, and finally, uh, Beth uh, Partlow, where are you, Beth? <laughs> now, she, she actually asked that, and I share this because she didn't want to divulge how old she is. Um, however, she recently celebrated a wedding anniversary, 33rd wedding anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not going to bore you with what I came to prepare to talk about. However, I will say um, that um, there's a lot happening in the world today. Oh, before I go there, one last thing. There was I forgot about Vareva Harris. Is Vareva here today? Vareva Harris uh, attended the Republican debate in Denver uh, last week. So um, hopefully we can get her to come up and tell us all of the wonderful things that happened off camera, as if uh, what happened on camera wasn't enough. <laughs> so uh, again, congratulations. But I, I was saying that there's a lot, of, uh, there's a lot going on in the world uh, today. And it's never more important uh, for us to think about the relationships that we have with each other. Um, just uh, this morning, uh, or actually uh, on s Sunday, Saturday, I was alerted to the fact that uh, one of my students, I teach University 101 uh, over at the University of South Carolina, amongst a number of other things, uh, but one of my students uh, recently jumped into a shallow pool and broke his neck. He's now a quadriplegic. Now, you hear these things, and, and you hear these things happening to older people, and you, you don't necessarily expect them, but when they happen to young folks who have such vibrance and and, uh, and hope and promise in their futures. Just kind of uh, 
you kind of take a step back and you think about the relationships that you have and the relationships that you've made and the impact that you obviously can have on someone else. So think about that. Uh, I ask that you pray for Michael Hope. He's a wonderful, outstanding student. Um, and all of you who have family members uh, who are uh, in, in some kind of illness or grieving or, or maybe not in uh, physical illness but maybe spiritual illness, we ask that you pray for, pray for them as well. Thanks and uh, have a wonderful day. Well done, John. Thank you. Um, our next announcement comes from Jonathan Milling. Uh, Jonathan's the foundation chair this year. Jonathan's going to tell you all uh, more about the Rotary International Foundation, where some of the money goes that we raise as a club, and give you an idea of uh, what's coming up as it relates to the foundation. Jonathan. Thank you, President Park. Good afternoon, everyone. When, when Mark volunteered me to be the, the foundation chair this year, <laughs> he, um, he said, yeah, John, I think it'd be a good idea for us to, to explain to everybody or remind everybody sort of how the, the foundation got its beginnings and things like that. Um, and, and so that's really what we want to take an opportunity to do. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. The, um, the foundation really was started, we'll, we'll get it there. The, the foundation was started in 1917 when I, then outgoing president Arch Klump proposed to set up an endowment, as he quoted, for the purpose of doing good in the world. That year, the first donation was made in the amount of $26.50. 11 years later, in 1928, it was renamed as the Rotary Foundation and became a distinct entity within what we are as, today as Rotary International. Through the years that the uh, foundation has grown, in 1929, the foundation made its first gift of $500 to the International Society for Crippled Children, which is what will become Easter Seals. When Paul Harris uh, died in 1947, the contributions really started pouring in to the Rotary International, uh, and the Paul Harris Memorial Fund was created to help build the foundation. In 1947, the foundation established the first program, the Fellowship for the Advancement Studies, later known as the Ambassadorial Scholarships. It continued to grow in 1965 and 66, when three programs were launched, the Group Study Exchange, the Awards for Technical Training, and the Grants for Activities in Keeping with the Objectives of the Rotary Foundation, which was later renamed as the Matching Grants. In 1985, the Polio Plus program was launched to eradicate polio worldwide. 1987-88, the first peace forums were held, leading to the Rotary Peace Fellowships. Since the first donation in 1917 of $26.50, the foundation has received contributions totaling more than $1 billion. Now, what do some of these funds go to today? Well, we mentioned Polio Plus. Since 1985, Rotary members have helped immunize more than 2.5 billion children. Today, all but three countries are free of polio. And as of June 2014, Rotary had committed more than 1.3 billion to global polio. I saw a study earlier today that said the last case of polio was reported in Nigeria on July 24th of 2014. Nigeria is the last country to be reporting polio in Africa. And tomorrow, August the 11th, the continent is poised to reach its own first full year without any illness from the virus. Other programs that your dollars go to help support are the Rotary Peace Centers, district grants, global grants, and other package grants. What is that? Well, the, the Rotary Peace Center, each year the foundation funds studies by Peace Fellows in six Rotary Peace Centers where they can earn master's degree professional development certificates. Since 2002-2003, more than 875 fellows from more than 120 countries have participated. The district grants help support smaller scale 
short-term projects related to found foundation missions. The global projects, or the global grants that I mentioned earlier, support large-scale international activities with sustainable, measurable outcomes that support Rotary's areas of focus. Activities include humanitarian projects, scholarships, and vocational training. And then the package grants, which also support the areas of focus, have been carried out without, with the Foundation's strategic partners. Last year, our group, this group here with us today, donated more than $35,000 to the Foundation. I think everybody should give yourselves a round of applause. Now, one other thing that Mark asked me to, to hit on that, that we periodically will hear about, usually three or four times a year, is Paul Harris. And what is a Paul Harris Fellow? Anyone who contributes or in whose name is contributed a gift of $1,000 or more to the Rotary Foundation is eligible to be a Paul Harris Fellow. That's when we bring everybody to the front, pin them, give a little bit of background information about that individual. Just because you do it once doesn't mean it's over with. Because there is where we have second Paul Harris Fellow and so on and so forth, multiple Paul Harris Fellows. Each time somebody receives that goal or receives that accolade, they're eligible to receive a new Paul Harris pin with one sapphire for each additional $1,000 gift of the five sapphires. They can put it in their own name, or as we've seen with several other members of our club, they can put the Paul Harris Fellowship in other individuals' names, whether it's a family member, a child, or someone else who's part of this group. A Paul Harris Fellow sustaining member is an individual who contributes or in whose name is contributed a minimum of $100. In addition, the individual has indicated an intention of becoming a Paul Harris Fellow by contributing a total of $1,000. The donor can take as much time as is needed to complete the $1,000 payment to become the Paul Harris Fellow. And sustaining members' credit can be transferred from individuals who don't plan to become a Paul Harris Fellow. The recommendation transfer request must be uh, completed and submitted to the, to the district just to make sure that everyone gets the appropriate credit. But as we can see with our donations, our club has done a great job donating a substantial amount to the foundation. When we see what we've been able to do with polio, and as of tomorrow, eradicating the virus in an entire continent, we are doing good with our money throughout the world and in our community. And I would ask you to continue with the donations and thank you again for all your support for the foundation. Jonathan, we'll be recognizing Paul Harris Fellows uh, later this month. So uh, thanks for your leadership on that, Jonathan. We appreciate it very much. Um, quick announcement before I turn it over to Anne Marie. There is, there's a pair of glasses that, has been, that have been left here the last two weeks, and I just wanted to see if anyone is missing their glasses that are up here at the front. Might, might belong to Jeff Griffin, but maybe not. Here they are, Jeff. We'll turn it over to Anne Marie to introduce our program. Thank you, President Mark. Can you hear me? All right, I know we've been having this issue the past couple weeks, so I thought I'd double check. Um, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you. And I know President-elect John has asked uh, most of us that are introducing speakers to say a little bit about ourselves before we do that as a way to get to know each other in the club. And uh, as I was thinking about what to say, I'd like to preface this by saying this was not a setup. Neither President Mark nor Jonathan knows that what I wanted to talk about in terms of I thought what I thought would be an introduction for you as opposed to just kind of running down a resume, which I'm happy to do with any of you at any time, and you'll get a look at some of the great work that I get to be involved in today through our speaker. But um, I thought I would talk about how I got involved in Rotary. And I've been involved with Rotary since 2002. And I got involved with Rotary when my husband, John, who many of you know as well, and I we're living in the Federated States of Micronesia, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We were living on an island in the Pacific. I was running an academic and technical high school there. And Rotary, there was a small Rotary club on the island. We were 12 people, mostly expats. 
we actually provided some scholarship funding to some of our students. But what I'd also like you to, to understand and know that why Rotary is so important to me and why I've stayed very attached to it is because I've had the opportunity firsthand to see some of what Jonathan was talking about in terms of where those foundation dollars go because where we were living, we were a developing country, we were a recipient country of some of the grants that Rotary International distributes. We received clean water uh, systems that we then went out, took on boats to outer islands to put at schools so that children could have clean drinking water at these schools. That was part of what Rotary International did and I've had the opportunity to see that firsthand. Since coming back to the States, my husband and I have stayed involved with Rotary International through another international program called the Guatemala Literacy Project. And actually this club very early on uh, decided to take this on for a couple of years. I kind of led the charge on that. And uh, my husband and I actually continue to make our contribution to that project through this club so that our club gets credit for having supported it. And last year, that particular project through Rotary International received a global grant of $372,000. But what that represented was 19 Rotary clubs from around the world in 18 districts coming together to contribute to literacy projects, to teacher training, to computer centers in rural Guatemala with the idea that it's through education that you break the cycle of poverty. So I think that probably gives you some insights into who I am and to what's important to me and why Rotary is important to me. And as I said, I swear it was not a setup, um, but it was what I thought might be more interesting to you than talking about um, some of the other work that I've had the privilege of working with so many people in this room in our community, in our state, both professionally and in terms of other community service. So it's such a pleasure to be here. And I think what the foundation and what those projects we've had a privilege to be a part of has shown is the power of really coming together and the power of collaboration. And what happens when you look at assets and you leverage resources. And the program that I'm going to be able to introduce to you today and our speaker, that's exactly the kind of collaboration that we're talking about. I have the privilege now of leading the South Carolina Council on Competitiveness. So many of you in this room have been a part of our work over our 11-year history. Uh, we are chaired by Ed Sellers. We began in 2004 as a way at looking at South Carolina's economic competitiveness and saying, what, is it, what are the assets that we need to leverage in the state? And how do we bring together industry clusters? And how do we do this in a very data-driven way to really take a broad-based approach to economic development? We're gonna to talk today specifically about the work that we're doing in aerospace, and Steve Towns is gonna to lead that for us. But I think a fantastic example of something we all have to celebrate was the announcement last week at the University of South Carolina in partnership with Boeing. Make no mistake, that's part of economic development in this state. And what I thought was so impressive about that partnership uh, announcement uh, was a quote from, and I'm certainly paraphrasing, uh, Dr. Tracy, who was the Chief Technology Officer of Boeing, and talking about this partnership that said, it's new innovations in aviation and aerospace are seen in the marketplace in future years. We can bet that because of this partnership with the University of South Carolina, that South Carolina has played a role in that. And that's what competitiveness is about. It's about knowing where the puck's going to be. And it's my privilege today to introduce our speaker, who is Steve Towns, who at the Council on Competitiveness, what we do is we look at how do we look statewide in these key industry sectors where we know we're going to have opportunities and build collaborative collaborations around all of these assets, but always led by our private sector. We work with the Department of Commerce, we work with all of our economic development alliances. We've been fortunate to have a long-standing partnership with the University of South Carolina and the McNair Center there in particular. And Steve is going to lay the groundwork for you to tell you what good things are ahead for the state and what opportunities we have if we seize these opportunities and become proactive about it. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Steve Towns. Steve is the founder and CEO of Ranger Aerospace from Greenville, South Carolina. And he is also our inaugural chairman for SC Aerospace, which, as he will tell you, is our industry cluster group uh, for South Carolina. Towns is an engineering graduate of West Point, where he won the Eisenhower Award in 1975. Towns served in the 1st Ranger Battalion as a young officer. He's had a distinguished aerospace industry career since 1980. 
He founded Ranger Airspace in 1997, and since then they have employed thousands of people in a successful series of private equity consolidation platforms. It is my pleasure to have with us today at Columbia Rotary Club, Steve Towns. Thank you. You, but I'm really bullish on aerospace, especially here in South Carolina. Did you hear the announcements this morning about Warren Buffett? He's bullish on our industry too. He's buying precision cast parts, which, which makes airplane parts, for $37 billion. For the financiers in the room, he's paying 20 times EBITDA for that business. So I'm thinking the next time I sell a company, I can say to them, hey, It'll be a bargain at just 10 times, keep it together. With that, if you'll give me just a moment to uh, have a little technical transition here, I have something I want to show you, which is I think is fascinating. It shows you how airplanes are actually built. So I'd like to ask you, have you flown on a commercial airplane any time in the last 12 months? Just raise your hand if you have, okay? Uh, do you know, how they, you know how they're put together? Let me show you. This is a time-lapse photography they're putting together. Oh, one more question. Raise your hand if you every now and then like to drive a car kind of fast. I think we all would admit that. Sure, you know, you know, or maybe go to the BMW test track up in Greenville. Well, this airplane, which weighs about 347 tons, fully loaded at maximum takeoff weight with fuel, passengers, and cargo, will go from zero to 60 in six seconds. Let's take a look. It takes 400,000 man hours to put this thing together in final assembly. Roughly 900 suppliers to put it all together in terms of their supply chain. Suppliers are in all 50 states, by the way. That's the largest landing gear invented for commercial aircraft ever. engines is powerful is more powerful than all eight engines on a B-52. On a triple seven there are 17 miles of wire, five miles of hydraulic tubing, and it takes over a thousand gallons of primer and paint, which weighs over 9,000 pounds by the time they get done buffing it up. And away it goes at 347 tons, zero to 60 in six seconds. It takes off at 155 knots, climbs out at 240, and cruises at Mach aerospace industry in South Carolina because it's an exciting place to be. Uh, you may not know it, but you're sitting right in the center of the fastest growing region in the entire aerospace industry worldwide. I'm going to, oops, pardon me. One aircraft transformed the world. Let's see here. 
sorry, the high low ground run. That's a YouTube playing in the background, not sure what it was. Uh, what I was going to say was, the industry in this region of the world, in the five southeastern states of the United States, has become the fastest growing region in the entire aerospace industry, worldwide. Let me show you some interesting facts. It's growing, I like to say, it's growing like Carolina kudzu, okay? We all know what kudzu is, you see it as you drive up and down the highways. But in fact, instead of smothering uh, the trees and so forth, this industry is spawning more and more jobs, more and more good things around the state and around the region. But as you think about this industry, which only started about 113 years ago, I mean, the Wright brothers flew in 1903, and here we are 100 years later with the, the amazing growth of this industry. Here's a factoid for you. The total air transportation industry is roughly $685 billion per year of everything that flies. That's everything from FedEx to Delta Airlines to the small FBO down the street that you might take a charter from. And then besides that, the aerospace industry itself, which produces all the planes, avionics, jets, rivets, fuel services, and so forth, is another $350 billion per year. So, roughly speaking, it's about a $1 trillion per year economic activity worldwide. And here we are, right in the center of it. One of the things that I like to point out to people who may not be familiar with airplanes is how long do they last? You've heard all the stories about $5 trillion worth of new orders for commercial airplanes. I mean, that's exciting. It really is. But what's more exciting, from my point of view, is that they last so long. Take a look at the data plate the next time you step onto an airplane. It's that little black and silver plate on the upper left-hand side of the door frame as you go in. And you'll typically see that that airplane is older than you thought. Another factoid. All the B-52s that are flying tonight to protect the skies uh, for the United States, every crewman in that airplane is younger than that airplane. So when they're well maintained, they last for a good long time. The installed base is the biggest phenomenon in the aerospace industry. When he's, when he's talking about Boeing building airplanes, let me show you what I mean. Because the aftermarket is actually bigger than prime production. Uh, not to get too technical here, but it takes four or five years to design and field an airplane, sometimes longer. And then when you build it, that's the $5 trillion worth of new build that they're talking about over the course of about 20 years. But in terms of aftermarket spares, parts, modifications, extensions, new wings, new winglets, new engines, the whole bit, airplanes just last a very, very long time. I've worked on airplanes that were 35, almost 40 years old in projects in our companies. So this phenomenon here, when you think about aerospace growth in South Carolina, once those, once those seeds are planted, like Boeing making their new billion dollar plant expansion that I saw down there a few weeks ago, once those seeds get planted, they stay a long time. Here's my fearless forecast that you'll see at the end of this presentation. Charleston Harbor is going to resemble Puget Sound in 20 years. Here we are in the center of the regional cluster of aerospace growth in the southeastern United States. You know, it started off in the northeastern United States with metal cutting companies, and then there was a big migration out to California. There's also a large cluster in the Texas and St. Louis corridor, also near Toulouse, France, and other, a few, few other places around the world. But this is hot. This is the hot zone with 1,400 companies and growing quickly, from Gulfstream down in Savannah to Honda Jet up in Winston-Salem. Airbus is putting a new plant in at Mobile, and of course, Boeing here in South Carolina. But the growth in South Carolina is not just Boeing. As you think about the total impact of how it's growing around the state, people think it's just Boeing. But there are 400 companies in the South Carolina aerospace cluster already. I've been in this cluster since approximately 1990 when I went to Greenville to join Stevens Aviation. At that time, there were about 100 companies in aviation around the state. Now it's 400 and growing like kudzu. The economic impact today is $17 billion. In other words, in 10 short years, the economic impact of aerospace is just as big as BMW and the 100 automotive companies in their supply chain. Think about that. The acceleration is picking up and the scale is bigger. Here's how it shakes out across the state. If you can see in the back, I'll, I'll generally point out what you're looking at here. We have three large groups of companies that are aggregating around South Carolina. The downstate group in the low country, obviously, centering a supply chain aggregation around Boeing. <clears throat> in the middle uh, of the state, you have firms that are servicing Shaw, Air Force Base especially. 
And then at the upstate, you have Lockheed, Stevens Aviation, and about 100 other companies that are doing all kinds of engineering and product support for airplanes. This phenomenon will continue to grow, and it doesn't stop, by the way, at our borders. Just outside our border to the southeast is the busiest airport in the world. Just outside our borders to the uh, north is the number two financial center in North America. There are a lot of reasons why we're at a very, very good crossroads. And by the way, they all use airplanes, of course. Around the state, let's take a look at the private sector and the military sector. The private sector, the obvious example starts with Boeing, but then the other 100 companies like Stevens Aviation or Hawthorne Global Services or Eagle Aviation here in Columbia are great examples of long-serving old line companies that are doing a very high quality, high safety job of flying people around. In the private sector also, a little bit more invisible to the average person, are the manufacturing jobs that are being created out of this. That's Boeing in the upper right. Okay, that everybody knows that's Boeing. Over here is a small company in the Greenville area that produces parts that you will never see. Okay, on that 777, raise your hand if you know how many parts are on a 777. It starts with a three. Roughly three million. Three million parts on a 777. Yep, I'm not kidding. Now, about a million of those are rivets, bolts, fasteners, clips, and, and ties. Okay, but two million are various types of parts produced in small companies like that that eventually end up in medium-sized companies like GKN down in Orangeburg and eventually go into the final production down in Boeing. The supply chain for this thing is absolutely mind-boggling. And the jobs that cascade out of it are really good jobs. How about advanced materials in our state? That's Torre Composites on the right. And on the left, if you haven't visited the Boeing plant, that's one of those giant mandrels, the way they're making the new composite fuselage for the 777. Advanced Materials is becoming an important footprint in South Carolina. Torre announced a $1 billion investment in Spartanburg. A billion. Service companies. Remember the chart that I showed you about the aftermarket? You know, if you can't get on new production, oh darn, I'm out of the industry. No way. There's six or seven times the aggregate value of economics that go with those airplanes after they fly away from the factory. So companies like Stevens Aviation, where I had the pleasure of being chief operating officer about a million years ago, work on those airplanes and keep them flying safely for you. Stevens is 65 years old, one of the best companies of its kind in the industry. And the fact that it is 65 years old and continues to propagate its brand and do good work is tangible evidence of why we need to grow more jobs in this state to support all this growth. And that's what I'm here to ask you about today. Now let's talk about military also. Right here in the Midlands, you've got McGuire as well as Shaw with a big footprint, 12,000 active employees. And you know what? We want some of the guys and ladies that are working at those air bases, if they like it in South Carolina, let's ask them to stay. Let's use the Palmetto Employment Project and other outreach to ask those people with those skills that they've already been trained on to join us here. You know why? If you can troubleshoot avionics, you've got a job for life. If you can fix an engine, a jet engine, you've got a job for life. If you know how to do composite repairs on almost anything that flies, you've got a job for life. And these aren't mundane jobs. These are really good jobs. A lot of new research, as Anna Reid pointed out, a lot of new innovation is going on in the industry. This, too, will spawn more and more economic development. The Condition-Based Maintenance Center at University of South Carolina here in Columbia is a partnership with IBM. They're trying to figure out how can I make myself more efficient on managing this 35-year asset. I've got to keep it flying. How can I do it better? And just last Thursday, this is Darla Moore and the president of the university and others announcing the huge partnership with Boeing. By Boeing putting their footprint so firmly into South Carolina and now this as the icing on the cake, it tells you, when I say that Boeing is going to be here permanently, do you think they would put billions of dollars into the ground in Charleston with all those thousands of jobs because they were here temporarily? Absolutely not. In fact, I've got some product development ideas to show you here in just a minute. So where's all this going? Well, the Secretary of Commerce, Bobby Hitt, a few years ago said, since all this growth is happening, is it going to happen by default or should we approach it by design? And so he assembled a number of CEOs and some general officers and, and uh, leaders from commerce to pull together the South Carolina Aerospace Task Force to come up with a comprehensive strategic plan 
on how to approach this gigantic industry that's growing whether we want it to or not and take maximum advantage for the state to benefit from. So we came up with a unified statewide effort. It's a combination led by industry. It's led by industry. It's not a government program. It's led by industry. Our board is made up of 16 CEOs who run companies. We are partnered with the South Carolina Committee, uh, Council on Competitiveness. We are also teamed with the Commerce Department, and we're talking to everybody across the state in government and academia as industry leads the way to try to pull all this together. I'm excited about it, you can tell. But the number one Achilles heel that we have and the number one opportunity that we have, all of us as business leaders, company owners, civic leaders, academic leaders, we have one big challenge. If this industry is continuing to grow in this state, we have to give it the feedstock of talent. Now, you know, years ago, kids in South Carolina that couldn't necessarily uh, go to Clemson or, or uh, get an advanced degree, they went to work in the mills, right? Well, the, the mills are gone now, but my industry has got rampant shortages that are predicted over the next 20 years. Shortages of pilots. Now, not everybody can be a pilot, but how about shortages of technicians? I could put up a third chart that says shortages of manufacturing skilled personnel for places like Boeing. So here's what it comes down to. Hey, I'm talking to Johnny at Greer High School. Or maybe, maybe Jane here at Dreer High School, where my daughter, by the way, is a, is a, a, a school teacher. Uh, if you want to have a really good job, the average manufacturing job in South Carolina pays $41,000 a year. Did you know that the average aerospace job in South Carolina pays $71,000 a year. I know people at Stevens Aviation, the only education formally that they have is a two-year airframe and power plant license from the FAA. That's all they've got, but it's like gold. Those people can prosecute a career for 35 and 40 years and retire making $120,000 to $140,000 a year uh, for a very long-term career in things that they love. You know, can you tell that I love my industry? It's really, it's really interesting and, and stimulating and, and downright cool sometimes to be around airplanes <coughs> and all the people that work on them. And, and so they're not only great jobs in a good environment, but they pay well. And of course, across the state, we've got the feedstock that can come up from our technical colleges. Now, take, take a moment here. We have 16 technical colleges in the state of South Carolina and terrific programs with Apprenticeship Carolina and Ready SC. But out of those 16 schools, only three right now are offering a and tickets, are offering FAA-oriented uh, courses. We need more of those, one at a time. We need each one of those schools, one at a time, to make a decision to affirmatively advance into the aerospace industry, including Midlands Tech. So uh, there are a few other places that are not so obvious. The Operation Palmetto Employment Plan is a program is a way for us to reach into the ranks of guys and gals that are coming out of the military to say, hey, you've got great rotorcraft skills. How would you like to go to Greenville and work there? Hey, you've got great uh, sheet metal skills. How would you like to go down and work at Eagle Aviation and so forth? Or, hey, you're an avionics troubleshooting ace and you've got a job for life at Lockheed if you want to. Those are the types of things that military people can do and step right into the job. The other thing is this. I have made a statewide call for an FAA aviation magnet high school in South Carolina. Do you know how many we have today? You're right, it's zero. I heard crickets. The answer is zero. And yet the surrounding states each have very robust programs of FAA magnet high schools. What's wrong with that picture? So it's complicated. It's got a lot of regulations and, and, and politics and funding associated with it. But we're going to try to make that happen as part of this new initiative called SC Aerospace. Now, looking toward the future, to the future, this is not a science fiction thing. This is actually out of the Boeing Design Center. It's a concept plane called the Sonic Cruiser. Note the blended wing. It'll have special types of uh, almost scramjet style engines on the back end. Uh, airplanes like this are coming. You may have seen announcements about this uh, recently from Airbus. Where will this plane be built? Think about it. That plane is going to be pretty much 100% composites. It's going to have advanced engines and engineering requirements and avionics. It's not going to be built in Seattle. There might be some subassembly in Seattle, but that plane is most likely going to be built here.
about these things. Think about 10 years from now. Fast forward with me 10 years. What will the skies look like when we have free flight uh, air traffic control? We're almost there now. Free flight means like in Star Wars, you know, where you go up into the grid and then you're just automatically flying like that. When free flight takes over within the next 10 years, our skies will blacken with drones. Hopefully they don't hit each other. Looking ahead, industry leaders around the state of South Carolina are saying the same thing that I'm saying with you today. We need to grab the kids in high school, get them excited about the industry, and show them that this isn't just some job. This is a really, really great career. They don't have to be a Harvard MBA. They don't have to be a Clemson engineer. A young person uh, coming out of the Air Force, let's say, as an E-5 that did his little short stint, or a young person going to Midlands, or excuse me, going to Trident Tech, let's say, down in North Charleston, to get just a two-year A&P license with the FAA, has a job for life, and they can do it right here in South Carolina, if we work on it on a coordinated basis and get them excited. So looking ahead, I want to look ahead short-term and long-term. Short-term is two weeks from now. Short term, there's the South Carolina Aerospace Expo here in Columbia. It'll be a big event. Governor Nikki Haley is the keynoter. We're expecting it to be even larger than last year. And this year, we're really focusing on that workforce challenge, training, development, and exciting young people to come into this industry. I think you'll see this as a, as a watershed event coming up here in Columbia in two weeks. And last but not least, as I conclude, and I'm happy to take a few questions if we have time, fearless forecast. You've seen the basics. I've shown you the metrics on the industry. I've shown you the metrics on how long the products last on our industry. They're constantly evolving with new technology. So what are we going to look like here in South Carolina in 10 years? This is my forecast. The supply chain will keep, continue to aggregate because that's just what industries do. Clustering is a very natural phenomenon. Instead of 17 billion in economic impact in 10 years, by the year 2025, my industry will have $35 billion worth of economic impact in the state of South Carolina within our borders. That'll spawn about 100,000 more jobs or more, okay? About 100,000 more jobs or more in 800 companies, or 400 now. It's not unreasonable to think that that count will probably double in the next 10 years. We will be absolutely reaching into the high schools and the technical colleges and the university system to create a permanent flow of talent and feedstock to feed this industry growth. And the adjacency with other states will be amazing. You know, the, 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 the industry doesn't stop at our border. I do business with Timco up in Greensboro, North Carolina. Okay. As I said, many thousands of new jobs. And last but not least, even for the, let's say, for the South Carolina Pension Fund, uh, opportunities to invest in companies or even whole sectors where it has such an important strategic impact on the state. So with that, I'm delighted to have been here, and I'll now take your questions. question over here. Yes, sir. I'll repeat each question as it's asked. Uh, what kind of uh, opportunities do you see coming up with um, drone technology? I've heard everything from, you know, uh, wedding photography, you know, sports photography, uh, land surveying for uh, farmers and developers, search and rescue. I mean, the possibilities for that are endless. And all it takes is a guy with a little, uh, you know, DJI phantom to do this. Um, I understand that the FAA had, uh, is against the law to sell any video footage right now that's made with a drone due to, you know, privacy concerns and security and all that, but that that law is to be revoked uh, about this time next year. Anyway, can you tell us what you see coming from that? I won't repeat the whole question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, the, the question is, where are we going with drones? What's that all about? Where is it going? At so many uses, so many utilizations. Uh, will the FAA ever get it straight and so forth? You saw what I was talking about, about the technical confluence of of uh, free flight, or in other words, uh, what I'll call perfected air traffic control in grids and drones. 
Uh, the FAA is probably going to be reluctant to allow a lot of propagation of drones until we get that figured out. You don't want drones crashing into helicopters and jets and so forth. But the technology is advanced, advancing so quickly, and there's such a real, real push <clears throat> from the public that there is activity going on in the FAA right now to come up with what they call rulemaking and put out some laws. So uh, everybody, everybody can anticipate that eventually it will still remain highly regulated, just like your commercial airliner is highly regulated. Uh, but drones are a phenomenon that is going to change, it's going to change the game, it really will. Just like drones have changed the game of warfare. You know, you've got young kids that are really good at uh, Pac-Man or other video games that are, you know, shooting Hellfire missiles from long distance, okay? Anyway, so you're right. Drones, huge phenomenon, don't know where it's going yet. Stay tuned. Next. Yes, sir. The kinds of jobs that you're, you're able to get for a college student who really doesn't know what, they're, what they want to do. Uh, they don't necessarily want to work in a factory. They want to have a job that's exciting. Or, but they're already in college. In other words, they may have just completed four years of college with a, with a degree. What are some of their opportunities that are exciting? To paraphrase the question, I'm not, I don't necessarily want to work in a factory, but I'm in college, or I'm about to finish college. Uh, could I get a good job in this industry if I'm not an engineer or a factory mechanic? Sure. You can get into business development. You can get into program management. Uh, all the major aerospace companies and medium-sized aerospace companies, so I'm talking thousands of employers, want people that have program management skills, supply chain management skills, IT skills, marketing skills. There's a lot of jobs. And don't, let, don't let me forget the finance. A lot of finance jobs. You know, can you imagine the financial intricacy of putting one of these things together with 900 suppliers in 50 states? You know, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. So there are plenty of jobs that don't include you know, putting a rivet into, a, into the fuselage or flying. Okay. I mean, in my own case, I guess I was originally an engineer, sort of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I've been in the industry now for coming up on uh, almost 36 years since I got out of the, out of the Rangers. And uh, I've never flown a plane. Well, actually, I've flown right seat a few times, but I shouldn't admit that. And, uh, and I think if I actually undertook the re complicated repair of a plane, the FAA would probably shut the facility. But I've employed thousands and thousands of people that do that stuff. So there are a lot of good jobs in this industry for people in college who are wondering what to do next. I'll take one more question and then we're going to uh, be done. Yes, sir. It's obviously a very complicated manufacturing process for a 777. How much do they test fly one of those before it's sent out to be put in service? With the complicated manufacturing of a 777 or any other airplane, how much do they test fly it? A lot. Uh, the five, the five-year development cycle is usually more like about nine or ten years from the time it's on the drawing board to the time it's actually flown. Uh, they'll create three or four test articles. They'll fly them, they break them. They actually, they'll have one aircraft that they actually test for its bending moments and bust that fuselage to see how much stress it can take. Uh, there's just a, a, an awful lot of testing. By the time you set foot on an airplane, it's a lot safer than getting in your car and driving home. Oh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Passion's contagious. Uh, love the energy and enthusiasm. Thanks for all you're doing for the state. Uh, we do have a token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you very much. Um, quick reminder uh, today at 3 o'clock for Ben Cannell's service at First Baptist, and uh, I'll call on President elect John Bakus to tell us what's coming up. Good afternoon. We're going to take a little break from the serious and overwhelmingly informative uh, programs that we've had lately. Next week, we have one of our own. We bring two of his good friends with him. Uh, Senator Thurman and another <laughs> senator yet to be named. We'll be here with our friend Glenn Ward next week. Uh, uh, Glenn will uh, thrill us with a little bit of humor and a wonderful message. Uh, so I hope you will join us next week for some fun. And, uh, and a really enjoyable program. Actually. We look forward to that, Glenn. Thank you. Stand and sing, please. <laughs>